I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Dr. Terry Ellis, who is an assistant professor at Boston University College of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences in the Department of Physical Therapy and Athletic Training. Dr. Ellis is also the director of the Center for Neurorehabilitation at Boston University and the director of the American Parkinson's Disease Association Neuro National Rehabilitation Resource Center housed at Boston University. Um, her research focuses on investigating the impact of exercise and rehabilitation on progression of disability in individuals with Parkinson's disease. Um, she has a particular interest in using mobile health technology to help persons with Parkinson's disease to engage in lifelong exercise. Dr. Ellis has a PhD in behavioral neurosciences from Boston University School of Medicine and is a licensed physical therapist, so a, so a fairly unique background here. Um, she has board certification in neurological physical therapy. She's published numerous articles and lectures internationally on topics related, related to neuro to, to rehabilitation and exercise in patients with Parkinson's disease. And this is a topic we're very interested in at our center, and we're very pleased to have her speak with us today. I'm going to try this route here. How's that? Can you hear me? Okay, great. So, oh, how about if I come out here? Can you hear me now? Is that okay? Great. So I'm going to start off by saying that fortunately exercise is legal <laughs> and uh, freely available and so you can access it now. No need to wait. Uh, no FDA approval needed, so let's get on it, right? That means we should be doing it, right? Okay, so let's see. What, so what is so special about exercise? Probably a lot of people here are already exercising. Raise your hand if you're exercising. Okay, now I'm going to ask you at the end when I tell you all the parts of exercise that are important in uh, people with Parkinson's disease. And then I'll see sort of what aspects of these things that you're engaged in. And so we know that exercise is beneficial for everybody, right? Right? This, yeah. So, and, but what is so special about it uh, for people with Parkinson's disease? Well, exercise has been studied quite a bit in animal models. So it's been studied quite a bit in mice and even in monkeys. And what we've learned from animal models is that there seems to be, with exercise, there seems to be um, increased availability of dopamine. There seems to be a down regulation of what we call dopamine transporter. That allows more dopamine to hang around in the synapse so that it can be picked up more easily. And then in animal models, we also see increase in neurotrophic factors, things like GDNF and BDNF, and those chemicals are thought to be protective. They're thought to protect sick cells from dying, or the cells that produce dopamine in the substantia nigra, okay, in the midbrain. And so in the animal models, there's reason to, there's some pretty compelling evidence that exercise might be neuroprotective or protect the sick cells from dying. In other words, sort of slowing down the cell death. So what about in humans? So in humans, we don't know for sure. We don't know if exercise definitively helps slow down the progression of the disease because we don't have a good way to measure it. We don't have a good way to measure the protection uh, of those cells in the brain. The same with drug studies. We don't, we don't have a good way of knowing, um, you know, the, the ways we have of testing whether exercise is effective are the same that uh, drugs use. Uh, these tests that you do with the neurologist, these things, right? You do this and some of these things. And so they're behavioral, at the behavioral level. But we don't have a good way other than that of really testing whether we're, um, you know, protecting those cells in the substantia nigra, in that midbrain area. But the good news is that at the behavioral level, so when we test things like walking and balance and general mobility, that we have more and more studies, 
one of these, this one. More and more studies here over the course of time showing the benefits of exercise in people with Parkinson's disease. What's amazing to me is that in 1980, which isn't that long ago, we didn't have any studies. No rigorous randomized controlled trials looking at the benefits of exercise for people with Parkinson's disease. But over time here, you can see the significant increase. And this actually stops at 2007. There's a very, very, very steep incline after that. So we actually have significantly more trials in the last decade than ever before. So this is a, a big interest, big interest, largely because of the data from the animal models. OK, so everybody asks me, right? OK, I get it. Exercise is great. We should be doing it. It's important. And then everybody says to me, so what is the one best type of exercise right, that I need to do in, in, you know, for my Parkinson's disease? And then the next question I get after that most of the time are things like, well, how much do I have to do? Which is like code for what's the minimum <laughs> that I actually need to do to make a difference, right? And so what I, my answer to that is that there are actually, there's not a one best kind of exercise, right? So there's good news and bad news with that. There are multiple forms of exercise that are actually very, very important in people with Parkinson's disease for different reasons. And to get the best effect, it's actually best to tailor the exercise program to the individual depending on their particular profile or challenges, right? Some people have more problems with balance, for example. Other people have more problems with bradykinesia or moving more slowly. And therefore, different exercises are need to be prescribed to best target those particular challenges. And so in a nutshell, I'll lay it out right here at the front. Right? We have lots of evidence behavior, at the behavioral level that uh, aerobic exercise or cardiovascular exercise is very important. And uh, in fact, most of the animal studies involve aerobic exercise. So monkeys have, have run on treadmills, for example. And the mice, right, are running on the rat. On, on the, the mice and the rats are running on the wheel, right? So a lot of evidence from in the aerobic arena. And so, but the good news is, so aerobic is that, you know, when you're working, your heart rate is up, right? You're sweating. There's some, you're a little bit out of breath when you're exercising. And so the good news is, is that you have choices in, in when, you, when you choose what type of aerobic exercise that you'd like to engage in. Because no one form of aerobic exercise has been shown to be better than another. It's probably not that sort of the way that you're doing it. It's the fact that your heart rate is at the, uh, a sufficiently high level, right? Or that you're working hard enough to get an aerobic benefit. So we'll talk about some of the different ways to do that in a moment. And then there's strength training, right? Or resistance training using either weights or machines or bands. Again, it doesn't matter how you do it, okay? The idea is that you're you're providing resistance to the key muscle groups, all right? And we think that strength training is important because not only does it help sort of with force production, but it helps sort of on that same pathway as bradykinesia. So the bradykinesia, you know, that moving more slowly, what strength training does is help, help with recruitment of those pathways so that the muscles can be recruited faster and more efficiently. Right, so that you can move a little bit quicker and easier. And then there's balance training. Okay, we all know in Parkinson's, right, there's a, there's a risk, an increased risk of falling and losing your balance. So this is, again, another important area to target, which we'll talk about. And then stretching or range of motion is really important, um, for, particularly for people who have a lot of rigidity or stiffness, right? And for people that have um, pain, particularly pain, we see a lot of people with pain in the hip, the shoulder, the neck, and the back, right? Stretching, range of motion exercise can be particularly helpful for that. And then I like to talk about task-specific training. 
And what that means is that things like walking, it's important to actually practice the task of walking. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay. And so let's talk about cardiovascular exercise for a minute. So as I said, it, there's no one form of cardiovascular exercise that's more beneficial for, for another. But there might be a sort of a better choice for each individual. For example, walking on the treadmill. There's been a lot of studies in people with Parkinson's disease walking on a treadmill that have been very, it's, the treadmill can be very effective in helping improve gait speed or walking speed and step length to get a bigger steps. And then if you're walking faster, generally we can get more swinging in the arms, okay, which you probably have been, you know, you may, some of you may notice is reduced. So the reason the treadmill works is because many of you who have Parkinson's disease might notice that your walking starts off okay, but then it gets a little slower over time, right? The steps get a little shorter, get a little slower over time. Because in Parkinson's disease, the movements are not, you have difficulty with automaticity, right? They're less automatic, right? And so over time, they tend to slow down a little bit unless you think about it, right? You, when you think about it, then you're, oh, I've got to take bigger steps. I've got to walk faster. And you can actually do that. But nobody can go around thinking about walking all day long, right? And so the treadmill is like a pacer. That belt moves underneath. Right? And unless you uh, want to fall off the back, right, you actually have to keep going. Right? You have to keep that pace up. And so if it's safe, we often have people with Parkinson's disease walk on the treadmill, and we find the just right velocity, the just right speed to walk at to get some of the normal parts of walking that we're looking for, the arm swing, the trunk rotation, the optimal step length. So that can be a good idea for many people. People who freeze will have a difficult time walking on the treadmill generally. And so options like the bike might be a good one, a stationary bike. Or people that have a lot of balance problems that would, might have difficulty safely walking on a treadmill might do better with the bike. And so the bike can be also very effective. There were some early studies done with the bike that are in the process of being re replicated now you know, recommending a certain biking at a certain revolution, like above 80 revolutions per minute. So the resistance on the bike can be manipulated such that the cadence can be a little bit higher. Okay, so the bike can be a good, um, you know, a good, a good mode of exercise. And so you can think about, you, you know, a, a lot of people, one of the big questions, well, let me just tell you about this. This was a study done in Chicago by uh, um, Ergen Uch and his group. And basically, this was a study in which people with Parkinson's disease walked outside. So they walked outside or for 45 minutes three times a week. Okay, And they wore a heart rate monitor. And they had to keep their heart rate at a certain level that, that indicated at least moderate intensity exercise. And so in this particular study, he found lots of improvements in multiple areas. For example, um, Oxygen uptake became much more efficient, so better fitness and faster walking. And then these things that you do with the neurologist with your hands here, those motor symptoms became better. And then even thinking and fatigue and things like depression were significantly better after that six-month period as a result of this sort of brisk walking, 45 minutes three times a week. So now this is a not a controlled study. But there are other controlled studies that show very similar findings. So we know that aerobic exercise is particularly important. If, if aerobic exercise is neuroprotective, again, which we don't know in humans, but if it is, this is one of the reasons that we recommend aerobic exercise, particularly early in the disease. So we actually use aerobic exercise pretty moderately to vigorously early in the course of the disease in particular. Everybody asks, well, how hard do you have to work? And how many times a week do you have to do this? And what's the recommended dose? So we don't know definitively what the optimal dose is in people with Parkinson's disease. But there's a large multi-center randomized control trial that was just completed 
in this area. And this, these groups uh, have looked at the difference between a moderate and a high intensity aerobic exercise. Moderate meaning the, a little bit of uh, sweating and a little out of breath, like 60 to 65% heart rate max, compared to exercising at 80 to 85% heart rate max, four days a week walking on a treadmill over six months. Those results, the study just finished, I know that the paper is under review right now. This is called the SPARKS trial. So as soon as this data is available, which should be pretty soon, we'll have the answer to, uh, or at least more direction in this area as to whether moderate or vigorous exercise is better. We do know right now, I can tell you that we recommend at least moderate intensity aerobic exercise. Okay, so at least that 60 to 65 percent heart rate max, max, or if some people, some people with Parkinson's, their heart rate is not a good indicator of how hard they're working. So a little bit out of breath, some sweating, you know, feeling like it's sort of moderately challenging. So then what about the strength? We recommend strength training. This is a study done uh, by Daniel Corcos's group in Chicago, and they followed people for two years. People with Parkinson's disease did strength training two, twice a week, okay, over a two-year period. This was a randomized controlled trial, so they had a control group. And what they found, there were two groups here. Both groups participated in strength training, but one group of people with Parkinson's did strength training that was progressed over the course of two years. And the other group did strength training that stayed the same over two years. And it was the group that had the progressive strength training that had the best outcome. So their outcome here, okay, right there. So the outcome here, you can see the difference here in these scores, this motor scores here, the, 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 mostly the bradykinesia. So the slowness got better. And then here, the over amount of, overall amount of force production and the speed of movement was significantly better in the group who engaged in the progressive exercise program. This is really important. So a lot of people think about, well, I'll just um, I'll get an exercise program, I'll do the exercise program, I'll be all set. But just like medications, right? Medications have to be adjusted. They have to be adjusted fairly frequently. You have to be tested, again, to see if the medications need to be adjusted for you. The same goes for exercise. A one-time exercise program for life doesn't work, right? The exercise program has to be progressed, adjusted, changed as you change, right, in order to optimally meet your needs. So what this shows is that if you can do it, the exercise program should be a, a challenging, right? And as soon as you, something gets easy, it should, be you should be, it should be tweaked a little bit more and made a little bit more challenging to optimize the outcome. Okay, and then people who, with Parkinson's who engage in an exercise program should target certain muscle groups. And the muscle groups that need to be targeted in Parkinson's disease are the groups that we call the extensors. The ones in the, the big muscles in the legs, in the buttocks, in the, the quads, the hamstrings, the calf muscles, and then also here in the back, these muscles that hold you up, right, and have a more of a, a, an, an upright posture. These are particularly important because they seem to get less sort of drive and input from the brain, all right? And those are the ones that we want uh, increased activation. And so, Strengthening exercises can be done with weights, or you can go to the gym, but you don't have to. They can be done at home with no weight. And that doesn't mean they're going to be easier. That just means we're using body weight to, to provide the resistance. So this is just an example in this picture here how we can take something simple like sitting down and getting up from a chair that targets all of those lower extremity extensor muscles I talked about in a very simple way. And then we can make that squatting exercise more and more difficult as it becomes easier. And then I talked a little bit about range of motion or flexibility. 
and the importance of this, particularly for people who are stiff and rigid, okay? And particularly for people who have pain, this can be very effective. Again, there are particular areas that we target when we work on stretching and flexibility. It's those areas that tend to get short. And some of that, some of the short muscles develop because of the posture, that sort of flexed posture that some people with Parkinson's disease tend to assume. So not only do we want to stretch and target these muscle groups after um, a flexed posture has been assumed for a while, but we want to be proactive about this. Even people who don't have a flexed posture, right? We can target these muscles now because we know they tend to get shorter and stiff over time. And so we want to be proactive with many of these things. Proactive with the targeting the extensor muscles for strengthening, whether they're weak or not. We want to be proactive and target those muscles that tend to get short and stiff, whether they're stiff now or not, right? It's very important. Okay, and then what do we know about balance? Balance is particularly tricky in Parkinson's disease and should be definitely targeted. There have been a few studies. There are different ways to tackle balance. You can, Tai Chi, for example, there was a large study published several years ago now showing the benefits of Tai Chi to improve balance and to reduce falls in people with Parkinson's disease. In this particular study, a Tai Chi was found to be more effective than stretching to reduce faults, which makes perfect sense. But Tai Chi was not found to be any better than strength training or resistance training to reduce falls. They were both effective in reducing falls. So we know actually from multiple other studies that, that the strengthening exercises, the resistance training, is also really important in improving balance. Because in order to make a balance reaction, right, if I'm starting to fall, in order to make an appropriate balance reaction, my muscles actually have to turn on quick enough, and then there has to be enough muscles recruited to, make an, to, to create enough force to make an effective reaction, okay? And so we target these particular muscles that are very critical in, in responding to a balance perturbation, we target those specifically to improve balance and to reduce falling. And then there's also been actually some pretty rigorous studies looking at dance, right? Particularly tango. There's a group out at Wash U, Gammon Earhart, and, uh, and their group. And they did a one-year study looking at 62 people with Parkinson's disease. They participated in tango twice a week for a year. And they actually looked at improvements off medication, all right? And they found improvements in this, in this test, right? The one with the bradykinesia and the stiffness, that you, the, the one the neurologist does. And they found significant improvements in balance, walking, freezing, and quality of life. And so we, you know, so dance is another sort of option that we think is good for, for many things, including balance. And then I just want to point out the results of this large randomized control trial that was done in Australia. This is really important because they looked at reducing falls in people with Parkinson's disease. And one of the main messages here is what they found is that the biggest impact that the balance exercise had was on people earlier in the disease, people that had less disease severity, people that were falling less frequently, actually had the biggest sort of improvement. They fell a lot less. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up is because sometimes people don't get referred to physical therapy or don't seek physical therapy services until they're falling a lot and it's like a big problem, right? Well, we can help with that, but we can actually help more if people come early. In fact, I would rather see people early before they fall at all, right? so that we can actually take a preventative, proactive approach, right, to try to even prolong time to falls. We don't have good studies that show that, okay? But we do have studies that show that you can reduce frequency of falling, particularly early on. So don't wait until you fall or say, oh, I'm only falling once or twice. I don't really have a falling problem. You should get 
you know, intervention anyway, early, to prevent, right? To talk about, to, to emphasize pre prevention. And then I talked a little bit about focused practice of task. I think it's very important to work on things that you have trouble with, like getting in and out of bed or standing up from a chair or walking, for example. And so I talked a little bit about, okay, let's see, the lack of automaticity. And so in Parkinson's disease, because you sometimes that uh, these tasks become less automatic, so it requires thinking about them more. And there are, let me just see here. Here we go. And so in this, in this gentleman, he's walking fairly slowly here on this side. But what we do is we use music, in this case, okay, or a metronome, right and do that again. to try to drive faster walking. Basically, this is just an external cue that, makes, that helps to make walking more automatic. So you can see the difference there, I think. He's Both walking arms. faster, bigger steps, swinging yeah. his arms. And so, because in Parkinson's disease, because in Parkinson's disease, that there's that loss of that, without the dopamine, that internal automaticity is, is reduced. And so, how do you, not only do you have to walk more as part of exercise, but it's important to walk well, to walk with good quality. And there are certain ways to help walk with good quality. One is to walk with either a metronome at a certain beat or a certain cadence, or to use music, particularly music with a very, uh, a very easy to find beat, a very distinct beat. And then, so then how do you know how fast to walk or what the optimal beat is? Well, it depends on you. What I recommend is that, well, the biggest recommendation is to go to a physical therapist and they can help identify that for you or with you. Okay, but if you count how many steps you take in a minute, right, then you get a baseline, right? And so maybe it's 80 or 90 or 100 steps in a minute. Well, then you can add, if you're trying to walk faster and it's safe for you to walk faster, okay, and you don't have freezing, all right, then just getting music that's at that beat that you're walking at and practice just in training to that. Or find, or just l latching onto that to see if you can keep the beat, and then you can increase that by about ten percent. So if you start off at ninety and you want to walk faster, then you can find music that's at about a hundred beats per minute, or steps per minute. Okay. Now you can actually go to iTunes and you can download music based on the tempo, right? And if you don't know how to do that, um, you could ask your grandchildren. They know how to do it. <laughs> Okay, they know how to do it, and they can help. So one of the key messages here with exercise in animal models and in humans with Parkinson's disease is this, is that the exercise needs to be intense, specific, difficult, and complex. So basically, you can't just do what's easy and doesn't really feel like exercise, right? It's got to be a little bit challenging. It's got to be beyond your current capabilities. You've got to be pushed a little bit, right, in order to have the sort of most optimal outcome. This is just a retrospective study looking at a big database. And in 2,252 people with Parkinson's disease, they looked at, at, the, at the beginning, at baseline, they measured or asked people, they, so people self-reported, how much they were exercising. And they divided people with Parkinson's into two groups. Those that were exercising at least 150 minutes per week, and those that weren't exercising at all or were exercising less than that. And then they measured them a year later. And then a year later, what they found here is that the, those people who were regular exercisers, a year later, had better quality of life, mobility, physical function, cognition, and less disease severity. So we have lots and lots of much more now, and, and, it, and the studies lately in the last five, ten years or so are much more rigorous, showing the benefits of exercise at the behavioral level here, right, in people with Parkinson's disease. You know, particularly 
So if we don't know definitively if exercise slows down the progression of the disease itself in Parkinson's in humans, but we do know at the behavioral level that, park, that exercise reduces disability and it improves function. Right? And that is key, right? Because that is what leads to better quality of life over the long term. Okay, so the next big thing is like, how do you do all of this? Right? So now if I ask you, how many people are exercising at least 150 minutes a week of aerobic exercise? That's five times a week for 30 minutes, plus strengthening exercises, plus balance exercises, plus stretching exercises, right? How many people, yeah, so we have a few, uh, uh, less hands now, right? So then it's like, how do you do all this? How would I, would I spend my day exercising? How am I going to fit this in? How am I going to get myself to do it? You know, it's hard, right? This is hard. So a couple things. is one, I would encourage you to, that you should be, you know, part of your team should be a physical therapist who has expertise in Parkinson's disease. Because a physical therapist first can help identify the optimal program for you, okay? That's the first thing. Unfortunately, in our, in our healthcare system, oftentimes, uh, you know, people with Parkinson's, and this is often with many different, uh, people with many different diagno diagnoses or conditions, you know, there's the medical management up front, and there's uh, st unfortunately still um, no rehab event intervention early on, and then you know, the rehab happens a little later when there's more kind of overt disability. In our clinic and in many other clinics now, and this is happening more and more across the country, we see people with Parkinson's at the point of diagnosis and follow people regularly over time. Just like you go to see your neurologist, we follow people every six months. To have, do we do a battery of tests? And then we look at the exercise program and make the appropriate changes. So, you know, whoever it is you're seeing, you want to try to take this preventative, continuous approach across time. Now, in here, the problem is that even when I give people an exercise program and have them come back every six months, first of all, just having them come back every six months happens to be a really good motivator of getting people to do the exercise program. Because when they come back in six months and we do more measurements, we measure walking speed and all kinds of other aspects of walking. And we do a thorough postural control or balance testing. So we can see what's actually happening and monitor those changes over time. So everybody wants to do better on these tests. They know they're going to be retested. So that's impetus in itself to help keep people exercising. But this is where, too, and I know you have a lot of this here, there's all kinds of group exercises. Sometimes group exercises can be very motivating. Plus, you have to be there, right? They're at a certain time, a couple days a week, you have to show up. So that can be very helpful. You're going to talk about boxing later today. So boxing, you know, is a way to get some aerobic exercise, some strengthening, and some balance training, right, in, a, in, a, in one particular class. And you actually have to go at a certain time. This is just an example. I just wanted to show you one of the things we emphasize is, is, is you know, when possible, is more walking as in a form of aerobic exercise, brisk walking. And this is just a couple people we had in one of our um, randomized control trials in which we just gave people a Fitbit. So some, you know, probably a lot of you have trackers, right? Some of you have trackers, activity trackers that you wear, a bracelet or some, you know, Fitbit on your, yeah, I see some people having these things on. Just be careful. We actually did a small pilot study looking at the accuracy of these, um, of these monitors. And it turns out that people that have a lot of tremor who wear one of the wrist activity monitors can get a lot of extra credit. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I don't think that was really steps. All right? So actually, the most accurate monitors for people with Parkinson's are the kind you wear on your waist, the kind that attach, because you get more, more, more accurate information with the, the acceleration that's being picked up by the monitor when it's on your waist. And so here we just see an example, a couple of examples of people who, um, uh, you know, this is somebody who started off walking very sedentary, 4,500 steps 
uh, a day, okay, in, at, at baseline. And then with this program, with, a, with an activity monitor and brisk walking, over the course of the year, you see a significant increase so that they were walking closer to 7,000 steps by the end of that one year period. So even in Parkinson's disease, where this is supposed to be a, you know, a progressive disease, right, it, we can see improvements over the course of time, right? This individual had increased activity level over the course of time. We've actually done studies in which we have found, we've done observational studies in which we've just observed people with Parkinson's over a year without prescribing an exercise program. People just did what they typically did. And we found in one of our studies a 12% reduction in activity level over the course of a year despite the fact the medicines went up and the Parkinson's symptoms, these things, stayed the same over the course of a year. So the disease was well managed and stayed pretty stable, yet people were doing less and less. So it seems like the, it wasn't the disease severity that was driving less activity, that people were just becoming less active, right, even though the disease was stable, suggesting that this is modifiable, right? This is something that we can modify and change. People can become more active. This is an example of just data just an example of somebody that we follow and give a balance program and a walking program, and this is the data over time. And you don't even have to know what these numbers mean, but just to know that they're stable. They're staying pretty stable over the course of a three or four year period here, but we're monitoring these things and changing people's program. Now, in terms of the barriers to exercise, so in terms of, you know, we know that there are barriers to exercise. We've studied this in people, and there's lots of things that can get in the way. But we actually found that people's confidence or self-efficacy in exercise, those people who had low confidence in their ability to exercise weren't exercising very much. And those people who had higher confidence in their ability to exercise tend to be exercising more. The other thing is that some people with Parkinson's disease had low expectations about whether exercise could really make a difference. I hope I've changed that for you today, right? You should have very high expectations of the benefits of exercise. And those people who had high expectations are more likely to do it, right? So that's a very important piece. So I just wanted to tell you, one of the things that we're doing is we're trying to use, we recognize how much people struggle. And so one of the things we're doing is we're using mobile health technology, or a particular app, okay, that, that, that you can use on your cell phone or an iPad, so in which we keep connected to people in between their physical therapy visits over the six-month period. And so we did a small pilot study and using this, and I think I have here. So this is what it is, and I'm not invested in this app. I don't have any, um, any financial interest in this, and it could be other apps. And this is just somebody, you would go home, you would see yourself exercising. Standing in front of your chair with feet. You would hear the physical the therapist giving cues as to specifically how to exercise. Chair, and there could be back notes back. at the bottom from the physical therapist about what chest, not to forget or, or make sure you focus you. on. You, could, you would be watching yourself actually do the exercises. It would tell you how many to do. And then you would put in a little bit of data, like how hard was this, or how easy was this, or was it painful, or painless. And the physical therapist, we can see this data remotely. You can text us to ask a question. It's not 24-7 hotline or anything, the texting. It's not an immediate response, which we had to clarify. But, um, and then you see graphs. You see, about, you see graphs showing your progress over time. So what happens is, and then the physical therapist has the app on their end, and they, this just shows here how they're following a whole bunch of patients, people with Parkinson's, and that little orange circle means, oh, so-and-so left me a message, I've gotta go check that, so I can see what's happening. And so, we can make, what this does is it allows us to change the exercise program remotely. We, if we see an exercise is getting easier and easier, we can take the exercise away 
and, and put a new one in, right? Send you a little text saying, check out the new exercise to make it a little bit harder because we know that it has to be a little bit harder, a little bit harder over time in order for you to get the best benefit. In front of a chair with feet. If an exercise is painful, we can take that one away and say, instead of you saying, I can't do this program, it's painful, it's hurting me, forget it. We can say, oh, 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 I have a different one you can do that won't be painful, right? And so we can switch it up. And um, one of the things we learned is that if we keep this, if we get people exercising consistently in the first three months, we've got you. Those people who are exercising regularly and were able to make it a habit in the first three months were, became regular exercises through the course of the year, right? And so if we had a hard time getting people to get exor to exercise you know, regularly at the beginning, it, you know, of course that made it really, really hard over the course of the year. So it's that beginning. It's, get, it's making it a habit. It's scheduling it. It's putting it in your calendar, treating it like a meeting, right? When I get up in the morning and I go running, right? Some, there are some days I don't want to go running. <laughs> I'm tired, right? But it's in my, I just do it. It's in my calendar. It's what I do. It's part of my routine. I don't ask myself if I feel like going running. That would be deadly, <laughs> right? Geez, do I really feel like doing this today? Not really, you know? I don't ask myself that. It's just in my calendar. The alarm goes off, and then that's what I do next, as if it was a meeting, right? And so... This little cartoon here, what this shows is that sort of a pyramid of things and how to think about things. So here, what it shows here is not only is it important to exercise, exercise is a planned activity, a structured planned activity, okay? It's also important to be physically active during your life. It's not okay to do 30 minutes of exercise and take the rest of the day off. Right? The other 23 and a half hours sitting. Right? It's important for people with, it's important for anybody, but in Parkinson's, particularly important to be active during the day. In fact, we recommend that nobody sits for more than an hour without walking for 10 minutes. Okay? No sitting for more than an hour without walking for 10 minutes. All right? And then after that, after just regular physical activity here, then we have aerobic activity, okay, that should be done more often. That's something that should be done about five days a week for 30 minutes. And then a little less than that is the strengthening, the balance, I would add balance in here, and the stretching, those things can be done two or three days a week. All right, and then up here, see the small little box at the top? That's the amount of time you're supposed to spend sitting. Oh, so in those of you that it's reversed, Sometimes I see people in the pyramid is upside down, right? That's what we want to avoid. And so here's some tips. Walking is actually one of the best forms of cardiovascular and physical activity. It's the walking has to be brisk. The quality of the walking matters. So use a metronome or, or use music to keep you walking faster, right? Or you can try to keep up with your spouse or a friend. For every hour of sitting, walk for 10 minutes. It turns out that even though the recommendation is 30 minutes of aerobic exercise, it actually doesn't have to be done all at once. 10-minute bouts of walking or 10-minute bouts of aerobic activity done three times a day can have an equivalent benefit. So if you can do 10 minutes of walking and spread that out and just do it three times in a day, you've got it, right? That's important. Okay, here's just a little chart. This is a good way, something that you might find useful for yourself. Okay, here's what I'm supposed to be doing. Here's how many times. Here are the different buckets. And then these little pictures here, these give you some ideas. Look at all the different ways you can balance train. Tai Chi and boxing and dancing. And you could Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and you can check off. Got that, got that, did that, right? I'm all, I'm all good. There's also the American Parkinson's Disease Association has a free exercise booklet that you can download on their website. They can mail it to you or you can download it and print it out. It's called Be Active and Beyond. Our group actually wrote this. 
This is the pictures I showed you earlier of the strengthening exercises and the stretching are in this book. All right, and it also it does a lot of education in there about the kind of exercise. As part of the APDA Rehab Resource Center, we get funding and we, we have a exercise helpline. So anybody that has questions from around the country about exercise or rehabilitation, you can call us at this toll-free number or email us here and we can answer any questions you have about exercise. And then I just want to thank my team at uh, Boston University Center for Neuro Rehab. We have an excellent team and I'm privileged to be able to work with them and uh, many of you have probably uh, interacted with these guys. And then I'll take questions. Well, thank, thank you very much. A lot of very important information, and I, I hope people uh, will take it to heart and, and act on it. Um, yeah. uh, literally, yeah. So um, we only have time. We're, we're over time now, so just for a couple of quick questions. Um, one that was asked is, um, uh, you may have covered this, do, do people with sedentary lifestyles have a higher incidence of Parkinson's disease? Uh, do people with a sedentary lifestyle have a higher incidence of Parkinson's disease? Well, we do know that people who exercise vigorously as adults, you know, actually have a decreased risk of getting Parkinson's disease at, at an older age. So I guess the inverse is probably true. So that, that's just more data showing the potential neuroprotective effects of exercise. Uh, you know, it's not just exercise, there's a whole bunch of things, right, that contribute to whether you get Parkinson's disease or not. And there's environmental factors and genetic factors. But exercise is just one of those environmental factors that tend to reduce the risk. Thank you. Another question is, is there an optimal time of day when one should exercise? That's a great question. What time of day is best to exercise? It's best to, it's best to exercise when you feel your best and your medications are working the best because that allows you to take full advantage of the exercise program and move better and, be more, and exercise more successfully. So whatever time of day you feel the best is the time of day that's best to engage in exercise. Um, another person asked a question about other specific exercises you'd recommend to improve manual dexterity. Yeah, that is tricky. That is very understudied. And so hardly any of the exercise programs that have been studied actually look at fine motor control. So I don't, you know, I don't have a definitive answer for that. I do think that uh, just like in the other parts of the body, that working on uh, sort of speed of movement may be helpful in proving dexterity. But that's something we can look at in an individual